The creeping summer sun hung low on the dam rack, and the sweet scent of sugar drifted peacefully by on the breeze. Marcia and Van Jake whistled softly as she strolled along the parched thoroughfare, too absorbed in her own thoughts to pay attention to where she was going. Her feet knew the way by now. As she ambled through the crowds, past a lacklustre street merchant and an old shopkeeper who watched the world drift lazily by from the doorstep of his trinket store, she held her head low and concentrated on the tune that she was whistling. It was an old song, a remnant of the war when German soldiers sang it to their sweethearts. Martian had learned it from her mother, who was old enough to remember it from the first time round. She was so preoccupied with the music in her head that she tripped over the outstretched legs of a middle-aged businessman who was reading the Volkskrant and reclining in a wicker chair outside one of the many cafeterias that lined the busy streets beside the Amstel. Ach, der Leek, you stupid woman, be careful where you're going, he cried, throwing his newspaper down onto the table. You made me spill my tea. I'm sorry, sir, Martian replied, as she was jostled by the passers-by. I didn't see you there. Well, he sighed, reeling in his legs and sitting forward to look at her properly. Perhaps I can forgive you. Come closer so I can see you properly. Reluctantly, Martian complied. Even with her hood over her head, her long blonde hair caught the sunlight and lit up her pale face. That's better, replied the businessman, with what he thought was a friendly smile. My name is Felix, he added, stretching out her hand. What's yours? Martian, she replied, taking his hand and shaking it. When he released her, the hand was quickly withdrawn and buried beneath her shawl again. Martian, you say? What a lovely name. So, Martian. So, Martian, what's a beautiful young woman like you doing in such a hurry on a slow summer day? I, she began, her eyes darting from side to side beneath her thick, furrowed brow, analysing the tourist traffic for a gap in the crowd. I'm sorry, I have to go. Hey, wait, he cried, but it was too late. The pretty young Dutch woman had seized her opportunity and disappeared into the hustle and bustle of the dam rack. God verdam, Felix mumbled, rustling his paper. These women, they're crazy. When they're not dancing in the windows of the bars, they're running away like frightened mice. Felix drained his tea, stashed the newspaper in his leather briefcase, settled the bill and went about his business. He didn't leave a tip. Twenty minutes later, Martian had regained her composure and was winding her way shyly through the flower market. The scent of pollen polluted the air and left her drunk on the flower's rich nectar, and tulips were blooming everywhere in a rainbow of vivid life. She paused for a second to watch an altercation between an overexcited tourist and a wizened shopkeeper who was refusing to lower his prices. She'd seen the same old argument a dozen times before, only the names and the faces changed. It fascinated her how conflict was always present in even the most beautiful of places. Eventually the argument was over, and Martian continued to wander towards her destination. The flower market within the flower market, a small shop owned by an old friend of her mother's. When she was a little girl, she used to run around the store with a sense of awe and excitement. Nowadays, her heart raced for a different reason entirely. Maria, the young woman who earned a living of sorts by tending the tills by day and waitressing at night, was serving another customer when Martian arrived, so she paced aimlessly around the shelves to pass the time. It was a gardener's paradise, a storeroom for more bulbs, seeds and tools than anyone could ever need. Martian dipped her hand into a sack of sunflower seeds and let them cascade between her fingers like a fine rain. She laughed softly to herself and then glanced across to the counter, where Maria had just finished serving her customer. Martian seized her chance, grabbing a tulip bulb and walking over to the counter. Go to Middag, she said, smiling shyly. Hello, Martian, Maria replied. Back again, I see. Martian's rosy cheeks flushed even further and the smile spread to her hazel eyes. How can I help you today? Martian handed her the tulip bulb and felt a guilty thrill as their hands came into contact. Then, she silently counted out a couple of coins and handed them over to the woman. Their eyes met for a second and then Maria looked away. Is that all, Martian? she asked. That's all, Maria, she replied. Dank je vel. Tot zien, Martian. The two women smiled at each other and then Martian turned on her heels and walked out of the enclosure and back through the flower market towards the dam rack. Martian continued to visit the flower market on a near daily basis, making any excuse to walk through the dam rack towards the river, the flower market and Maria's store. Even when she was working, she used her lunch break as an excuse to eat on the move on her way to the riverside. Each time, she'd browse the shelves and examine the stock until Maria had finished serving her other customers, and then she'd buy a single tulip bulb. After a couple of weeks, she even learned to bring exact change in case the tills were running dry. In all the times that she visited the market, she exchanged barely a thousand words with Maria. But Martian didn't speak much to anyone. She had a secret, and like most people with secrets, she was scared of idle talk in case the secret slipped out. 
All too quickly, summer turned into autumn and then winter, and yet despite the growing cold and the frost that covered the ground, Martian maintained a steady flow of visits to the flower market. Christmas came and went without a commotion, and spring rolled around with an explosion of colour as the flowers roared into life across the city. One warm afternoon at the end of March, with her curiosity finally piqued, Maria decided to follow Martian home. As soon as Martian left the shop, Maria threw a jacket and a hood on and slipped out after her. She followed Martian as she meandered back through the streets, along the riverside and up the dam rack towards her little house on the other side of Central Station. Every now and then, Martian would look up from her feet and glance around as if she knew she was being followed, but Maria reacted quickly and dodged out of the way every time she looked around. It wasn't hard. The streets were packed, and with her hood on, her bland features were camouflaged even further. Eventually, Martian slowed down and began to pat her pockets for her keys, and Maria observed her from a distance as she let herself into a small front garden by pulling open a cast iron gate. Maria glimpsed vivid reds and vibrant yellows and approached the gate with caution to get a better view. What she saw there shocked her. Martian was sitting on a bench beside the front door, meditating in the tranquility of the garden as the bicycles roared silently past on the streets outside. But that wasn't what caught Maria's attention. That was seized by the sight of her own name planted in the soil with the bulbs that Martian had been buying on her daily visits. The letters shone gold in the light of the sun and they were bordered by a sea of red tulips which threatened to spill out of the garden and into the sleepy streets. Just then Martian opened her eyes and Maria was too stunned to try to hide. The two women looked at each other for a second and then Martian stood up and moved towards the gate. Maria, she cried, wait, I can explain. But it was too late. Maria had regained her senses and she was off down the street like a bullet, already out of sight by the time that Martian was past the gate. Martian didn't return to the flower market the following day, and she didn't return the day after that either. The day after that was a Friday, the sun was shining and Martian was in higher spirits. She even braved the walk through the dam rack towards the river and the flower markets. When she returned to Maria's stall, the woman was missing. Martian didn't even bother to browse the shelves. Instead, she marched straight up to the cashier, who was in the middle of selling a garden hoe to an elderly woman in a wheelchair, and interrupted her. Excuse me, she said, approaching the cashier timidly and with her eyes averted. Where's Maria? Maria, he replied. Maria doesn't work here anymore, Shadja. Can I help? It depends, she told him. Do you know where she went? I'm afraid not, he said. I'm sorry. She told us that it was urgent and that she wouldn't be coming back. I see, Martian replied, deflated. I understand now. Thanks, Javel. Martian turned on her heels and left the cashier to deal with his customer. She didn't look back. It was six months later and summer was coming to its inevitable end. The flowers in Martian's garden were beginning to wither and the weeds were creeping in over the borders. The whole garden had taken on an air of neglect and the young woman had stayed away from the flower market. On that day, towards the end of September, she was walking north, away from the Damrak and the picturesque centre of the city, away from the sweet smell of sugar and flowers, away from the Amstel and towards the slaughterhouses, shipyards and warehouses on the outskirts of the city. Martian walked through the streets with her head down, her hands inside her shawl and her mind on one thing only. The smell of fish, freshly caught and brought to market while they were still alive, clung to her nostrils as she walked through the market at random. Alas, she found what she was looking for. A juicy huss, preserved on ice and on sale at a reasonable price. The young woman approached the counter shyly. This was her first time at the fish market and she didn't know what to say. The woman who worked behind the counter seemed to sense this, and she took the time to help her, bidding her farewell with a polite smile as Martian began the long walk home with a fish wrapped up in yesterday's newspaper. Martian returned to the fish market the following day, and the day after that as well. As the focus of her attention slowly shifted, the flowers in her garden continued to wither with the inevitable onset of another long winter.